Hello everyone, welcome to theCUBE's presentation of the AWS Startup Showcase. We're in season two, episode three, and this is the topic of MarTech and the emerging cloud scale customer experiences, the ongoing coverage of AWS's ecosystem of, of large scale growth and new companies and growing companies. I'm your host, John Furrier. We're excited to have Tim Barnes, Global Director, General Manager of Advertiser and Marketing at AWS, here at doing the keynote, Cloud Scale Customer Experience. Tim, thanks for coming on. Oh, great to be here and thank you for having me. You know, you've seen many cycles of innovation, certainly in the ad tech platform space around data, serving consumers and a lot of big, big scale advertisers over the years as the web 1.0, 2.0, now 3.0 coming, cloud scale, role of data, all, all big conversations. Has changing the game, we see things like cookies going away. What does this all mean? Silos, walled gardens. A lot of new things are impacting the applications and expectations of consumers, which is also impacting the folks trying to reach the consumers. And this is kind of creating a, a kind of a current situation, which is challenging, but also an opportunity. Can you share your perspective of what this current situation is as the emerging MarTech landscape emerges? Yeah, sure, John. I, you know, it's, it's funny in this industry, the only constant is change and it's, it's an ever changing industry and, and, and never more so than right now. I mean, we're seeing with, whether it's the rise of uh, privacy legislation or uh, you know, just breach of security of data or changes in how the top tech providers and browser controllers are, are changing their process for, um, for reaching customers. This is a, an inflection point in the history of both ad tech and MarTech. Um, you know, you, you hit the nail on the head with cookie deprecation, uh, with Apple removing IDFA, uh, changes to browsers, et cetera. We're, we're at a, you know, an interesting point. And, and by the way, we're also seeing an explosion of content sources and an ability to reach customers that's uh, unmatched in the history of advertising. So those two th things are, are somewhat at odds. So whether we see the rise of connected television or digital out of home, you mentioned web 3.0 and the opportunities that may present in metaverse, et cetera. Um, it's an explosion of opportunity, but how do we continue to, uh, connect brands with customers and do so in a privacy compliant way. And that's, that's really the big challenge we're facing. Um, you know, one of the things that, that I see is the, the rise of uh, modeling or machine learning as a mechanism to help remove some of these barriers. It, you know, if you think about the idea of one-to-one -one targeting, well, that's going to be less and less uh, possible as we, as we progress. So how am I still, as a, an, a brand advertiser or as a targeted advertiser, how am I going to still reach the right audience with the right message in a world where I don't necessarily know who they are? And modeling is a really key way of, of achieving that goal. And we're seeing that across a number of different angles. You know, we've always talked about in the ad tech business for years, it's the, it's the behemoth of contextual and behavioral, you know, those right. dynamics. And if you look at the content side of the business, you have now this new massive source of new sources, new, 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 you know, blogging has been around for a long time. You got video, you got newsletters, you got all kinds of people self-publishing. That's been around for a while, right? So you see now these new sources. Trust is a big factor, but everyone wants to control their data. Right, mm -hmm. so, so this walled garden perpetuation of value, I got to control my data, but machine learning works best when you expose data. So this is kind of a paradox. Can you talk about the current challenge here and how to overcome it? Because you can't fight fashion as they say. And we see yeah. people kind of going down this road of saying data is a competitive advantage, but I got to figure out a way to keep it, own it, but also share it for the machine learning. What's your, right, what's right. your take on that? Yeah, I, I think first and foremost, if I may, I, I would just start with, it's super important to make that connection with the consumer in the first place. So you hit the nail on the head for um, advertisers and marketers today, the importance of gaining first party access to your customer and, and with permission and consent is paramount. Um, and so just how you establish that connection point with trust and with um, you know, very clear directive on how you're going to use the data has never been more important. So I would start there if I was a brand advertiser or a marketer trying to figure out how I'm going to better connect with my consumers and get more first party data that I could leverage. Um, so that's, you know, just building the scale of first party data um, to enable you to actually perform some of the, um, the types of approaches we'll discuss. Um, this, the second thing I would say is that, you know, increasingly, the challenge exists with the exchange of the data itself. So if I'm a uh, data controller, if I own a set of first party data that I have consent with consumers to use, 
and I'm passing that data over to a third party and that data is leaked, I'm still responsible for that data. Or if somebody wants to opt out of a communication and that opt out signal doesn't flow to the third party, I'm still liable, or at least from the consumer's perspective, I've, I've provided a poor customer experience. Um, and that's where we see the rise of um, you know, the next generation, I call it, of data clean rooms, uh, the approaches uh, that uh, you're seeing a number of customers take in terms of how they connect data without actually moving the data between two sources. Um, and, and we're seeing that as, a, as, a, as certainly a mechanism by which um, you can preserve accessibility data. We call that um, federated data exchange uh, or federated data clean rooms. Um, and, and I think you're seeing that from a number of different parties in the industry. That's awesome. I want to get into the data interoperability because we have a lot of startups presenting in this episode around that area. But while I got you here, you mentioned data clean room. Could you yep. define for us, what is a federated data clean room? What is that about? Yeah, I would simply des describe it as zero data movement in a privacy and secure environment. Uh, to be a little bit more explicit and detailed, uh, it really is the idea that if, if I'm a, a party A and I want to exchange data with party B, how can I run a query for analytics or other purposes without actually moving data anywhere? Can I uh, run a query that has accessibility to both parties that has the security and the levels of aggregation that both parties agree to and then run the query and get those results that sets back in a way that it actually facilitates business um, between the two parties. Uh, and we're seeing that uh, you know, ex expand with uh, partners like Snowflake and InfoSom and uh, you know, uh, even within Amazon itself, AWS, we have data sharing capabilities within Redshift and some of our other data lake capabilities. And, and we're just seeing an explosion of demand and need for customers to be able to share data, but do it in a way where they still control the data and don't ever hand it over to a third party for execution. So if I understand this correctly, this is kind of an evolution to kind of take away the middleman, if you will, between parties that used to be historically the case. Is that right? Yeah, I'd say there's, the middleman still exists in many cases. If you think about um, joining uh, two parties data together, you still have the problem of um, the match key, right? How do I make sure that I get the broadest set of data to match up with the broadest set of data on the other side? Um, so we have a number of partners uh, that, that provide these types of services from LiveRamp, TransUnion, Experian, et cetera. Um, so there's still a place for that uh, so-called middleman in terms of helping to facilitate the transaction. But as a clean room itself, I think that term is becoming outdated in terms of a physical third party location where you push data for analysis that's controlled by a third party. Yeah, great, great uh, clarification there. I want to get into this data interoperability because the benefits of AWS and cloud scale as we've seen over the, the past decade and, and looking forward is it's an API based economy, right? So APIs and microservices, cloud native stuff is going to be the key to, to integration. And so connecting people together is kind of what we're seeing as the trend. People are connecting their data, they're sharing code in open source. So there's an opportunity to connect the ecosystem of companies out there with mm -hmm. their data. Can you share your view on this interoperability trend, why it's important, and what's the impact to customers who want to go down this either automated or programmatic connection-oriented way of connecting data? No, never more important than it has been right now. I mean, if you think about the way we transacted, and still to today do to a certain extent, uh, through cookie swaps and, and all sorts of crazy exchanges of data, um, those are going away at some point in the future. Uh, you know, it could be a year from now, it could be later, but uh, they're going away. And I think that that puts a great amount of pressure on the broad ecosystem of customers who are uh, who, who transact for marketers on behalf of marketers, um, both for advertising and marketing. And so, data interoperability to me is how we think about um, providing that transactional layer between uh, multiple parties so that they can continue to transact in a way that's meaningful and seamless. And frankly, at lower cost and at greater scale than we've done in the past with less uh, complexity. Um, and so, you know, we're seeing a number of, of changes in that regard, whether that's data sharing and, and data clean rooms or federated clean rooms, as we described earlier, uh, whether that's um, the rise of uh, next generation um, identity solutions, for example, um, the UID uh, 2.0 consortium, uh, which is an effort to um, use hashed email addresses and, and other forms of identifiers to facilitate data exchange for the programmatic ecosystem. Um, you know, these are sort of evolutions based on this notion that 
the old world is going away, the new world is coming. And part of that is how do we connect data sources in a more seamless and, um, and frankly efficient manner. It's almost interesting, it's, it's almost flipped upside down. You had you know, this walled garden mentality, I got to control my data, but now I have data interoperability. So you got you to gotta own and collect the data, but also share it. This is going to kind of change the paradigm on identity platforms, attributions, audience, as audiences move around. And with cookies going away, this is going to require a new abstraction, a new way to do it. So you mentioned some of those standards. Are, mm -hmm. Is there a path in this evolution that changes it for the better. What's your view on this? What do you see happening? What's going to come out of this new wave? Yeah, you know, my, my father was always fond of telling me, um, you know, the customer, my customer is, is my customer. And, and I like to put myself in the shoes of, you know, the Mark Pritchards of the world at Procter and Gamble and think, what is what do, what do they want? And, and frankly, their requirements and, and for data and for marketing have not changed over the last 20 years. It's, I want to reach the right customer at the right time with the right message, and I want to be able to measure it. In other words, summarizing, I want omni-channel execution with omni-channel measurement. Uh, and, and that's become increasingly difficult as you highlighted with the rise of the wall gardens and increasingly data living in silos. And so I, I think it's important that we as an industry start to think about what's in the best interest of the one customer who brings virtually 100% of the dollars to this marketplace, which is the CMO and the CMO office. And how do we think about returning value to them in a way that is meaningful and actually drives this industry forward? And I think that's where you know the data oper operability piece becomes really important. How do we think about connecting uh, the omni-channel uh, channels of execution uh, how do we connect that with uh, partners who uh, run uh, attribution uh, offerings with machine learning or partners who provide um, augmentation or enrichment data such as third-party data uh, providers or um, even connecting the uh, the buy side with the sell side in a more efficient manner how do I how do I make that connection between the CMO and the publisher in a more efficient and effective way um, and these are all challenges facing us today. And I think at the, you know, the foundational layer of that is how do we think about, first of all, um, what, is the, what data does the marketer have? What is their first party data? How do we help them ethically source and collect more of that data mm -hmm. with proper consent? Um, and then how do we help them join that data into a variety of data sources in a way that they can gain value from it? Uh, and that's where machine learning really comes into play. So whether that's the notion of audience expansion, whether that's looking for you know some sort of cohort analysis that helps with uh, contextual advertising, whether that's the notion of um, you know a more of a, a, a modeled approach to attribution versus a one-to-one -one approach, all of those things I think are in play as we think about returning value back to that uh, that customer of our customer. It's interesting you broke down the customer needs in three areas: CMO, office, and staff partners, ISV, software developers, and then third-party services. Kind of all different needs, if you will, kind of tiered. Kind of at the center of that's the user, right? The, the consumer who have expect expectations. So it's interesting, you have the stakeholders, you laid out kind of those three areas as customers, but the end user, the consumer, they have a preference. They kind of don't want to be locked into one thing. They want to move around, they want to they they download apps, they want to play on Reddit, they want to be on LinkedIn, they want to be all over the place, they don't want to get locked in. So you have now kind of this high velocity user behavior. Mm -hmm. How do you see that factoring in? Because you know, with cookies going away and kind of the convergence of offline online really becoming predominant, how do you know someone's paying attention to what and when, attention and reputation? All these things seem complex. What, how do you make sense of it? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I, I think that um, the the consumer, as you said, uh, finds a creepiness factor with a message that follows them around their various uh, sources of engagement with content. Um, so I think there's a, at first and foremost, there's the recognition by the brand that we need to be a little bit more thoughtful about how we interact with our customer and how we build that trust and that relationship with the customer. Um, and, and, and that all starts with, of course, opt-in process, uh, consent management, et cetera, but it also includes how we communicate with them. What message are we actually putting in front of them? Is it meaningful? Is it impactful? Does it drive value for the customer? I think we've seen a lot of studies, I won't, I won't recite them, that state that most consumers do find value in targeted messaging 
but I think they want it done correctly. And, th and therein lies the problem. So what does that mean by channel, especially when we lose the ability to look at that consumer interaction across those channels? And I think that's where we have to be a little bit more thoughtful with, frankly, kind of going back to the beginning with contextual advertising, with um, with advertising that uh, perhaps has meaning or is uh, has empathy with the consumer, uh, perhaps resonates with the consumer in a, in a different way than just a targeted message. Um, and we're seeing that trend. You know, we're seeing that trend both in television, connected television, as those converge, but also as we see about uh, connectivity with um, you know gaming and other other sort of more nuanced channels. Um, the other thing I would say is. Um, I think there's a movement towards less interruptive advertising as well, which which kind of removes a little bit of those barriers for the consumer and the brand to interact. Um, and whether that be dynamic product placement, uh, content optimization, um, or whether that be sponsorship type opportunities within digital, I think we're seeing an increased movement towards those types of um, executions, which I think will also provide value to both parties. Yeah, I think you nailed it there. I totally agree with you on the contextual uh, targeting. I think that's a huge deal and that's proven over the years that, of providing benefit. People are uh, look, they're trying to find what they're looking for, whether it's data to, to consume or a solution they want to buy. So I think that all kind of ties together. The, the question is these three stakeholders, the CMO office and staff you mentioned, and the, you know, the IS software developers, the apps or walled gardens, and then like ad servers as they come together, have to have standards. And so, you know, I think to me, I'm trying to squint through all the, the movement and the shifting plates uh, that are going on in the industry and trying to figure out where are the dots connecting. And, you know, you've seen many cycles of innovation. At the end of the day, it comes down to who can perform best for the end user as well as the marketers and advertisers. So that balance, what's your view on this, this shift? Um, it's going to land somewhere. It has to land in the right area. The market is very efficient. I mean, this ad market's very efficient. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, in, in some ways, so from a standards perspective, I, you know, I, I support and we, we uh, interact uh, extensively with the IAB and other, uh, other industry associations on privacy enhancing technologies and how we think about these next generations of connection points or uh, identifiers to connect with consumers. But I'd say this, um, with respect to the CMO, and I mentioned the publisher earlier, I think you know, over the last 10 years with the rise of programmatic, certainly we saw the, um, the power reside mostly with the CMO who was able to uh, amass a large pool of cookies or purchase a large you know, sort of cohort of customers with cookie based attributes and, um, and then execute against that. It's almost a blind fashion to the publisher. The publisher was sort of left to say, hey, here's an opportunity, do you want to buy it or not? With no real reason why the marketer might be um, buying that customer. Um, and I think that we're seeing a shift backwards towards the publisher and perhaps a healthy balance between the two. And so. You know, I, I do believe that over time that we're going to see publishers uh, provide a lot more, um, what I might almost describe as mini wall gardens, right? So the ability for a publisher or a, a, a set of publishers to create a cohort of customers that can be targeted through programmatic or perhaps through, um, you know, programmatic guaranteed in a way that um, it's it's a balance between the two. And, and, and frankly, thinking about that uh, notion of federated uh, data clean rooms, uh, you can see an approach where publishers are able to share their first party data with a marketer's first party data without either party feeling like they're giving up something or, or passing all their value over to the other. And I, I do believe we're going to see some uh, significant technology changes over the next three to four years that really rely on that uh, interplay between the marketer and the publisher in a way that it, it, it helps both sides achieve their goals. And that is, you know, increasing value back to the publisher in terms of higher CPMs and of course, uh, better uh, reach and frequency controls for the, uh, for, the, for the marketer. I think you really uh, brought up a big point there we can maybe follow up on, but I think this idea of publishers getting more control and power and value is an example of the market filling a void in the power law, you get the long tail it's kind of a straight line, then it's got the niche kind of communities. It's growing in, in the middle there. And I think the middle of the torso of that power law is the publishers uh, because they have all the technology to measure the journeys and the click throughs and all this traffic going on on their, their platform, but they just need to connect to someone else that Correct. brings yeah. in the interoperability. So, you know, as, as a publisher ourselves, we see that, that long tail getting really kind of fat in the middle where new brands are going to emerge if they have audience 
I mean, some podcasts have millions of users and some blogs well, are attracting massive I, audience, niche audiences that are growing. I, you know, I, I would say just look at the rise of uh, what we might not have considered publishers in the past, but are certainly growing as publishers today. Customers like Instacart or Uber who are creating ad platforms or gaming, which of course has been an ad, ad supported platform for some time, but is growing immensely. Um, retail as a platform, of course, amazon.com being one of the biggest uh, retail platforms with um, advertising uh, supported models. Uh, but we're seeing that growth across the board for retail customers. And I think that, you know, again, there's, there's never been more opportunities to reach customers. We just have to do it the right way in a way that it's uh, not offensive to customers, not uh, creepy, if you want to call it that, and also uh, maximizes value for both parties and not for, uh, and that be the, both the buy and the sell side. Yeah, everyone's a publisher now, everyone's a media company, everyone has their own right. news network, everyone has their own retail. It's a completely new world. Tim, thanks for coming on and sharing your perspective and insights on this keynote. Tim Barnes, Global Director, General okay. Manager of Advertiser and Market at AWS here with the episode three of season two of the AWS Startup Showcase. I'm John Furrier, thanks for watching.